Hi, I'm Greg Vanish from Calibrated Success and welcome to another DVD tuning training video. In today's video, we're going to be talking about Ford electronic fuel injection systems. And in this video today, what we're really going to do is follow along as I tune a car from start to finish. As we go through that process of tuning from start to finish, we're going to learn a lot about not only our car, but also the software that we're going to be using and the procedures which I follow to get the best behavior out of the car. The software we'll be using today is SCT and they have both the Advantage calibration software and the LiveLink data logging software. And between the two of them, it's a pretty powerful combination of tools that allow us to record everything that's going on inside the car and make intelligent changes to the calibration. We're going to make sure that we make intelligent calibration changes because we don't want to sit there and chase our tail. We always know that, oh, well, it's a little rich or a little lean. No, what we're going to be doing today is taking the engineer's approach and putting a number on it. We'll take a good quality air-fuel ratio measurement using a laboratory-grade wideband. Today I'm going to be using my ECM wideband and not using the factory narrowband O2 sensors at all. Now I know a lot of people have tuned cars using the fuel trims and watch and see what it learns, but you always give up a little bit of accuracy when you're doing that and you're trusting an unknown age of an unknown oxygen sensor. My laboratory-grade sensor was calibrated this morning before I plugged it into this car, so I know that it's not only healthy, but also accurate. So what we're going to do is use that high-quality sensor to do open loop calibration to develop our airflow model. The airflow model in a modern Ford vehicle is mass airflow sensor based. And so obviously the transfer function for the mass airflow sensor is very important. In addition to the mass airflow sensor transfer function, we also have a table called load with failed math on many of these vehicles. That load with failed math table is important to the ECU because it's get used during transient throttle conditions. Anytime the driver steps in or out of the throttle and we have a rapid onset of change of airflow, that ECU tends to look to that load with failed MAF to get a first guess before the MAF sensor catches up. So we want to make sure that that reference table matches the reality of the hardware on our car. Speaking of the hardware on our car, today's sample is a 2010 Mustang GT, but it also has the Celine supercharger on it. It's a Series 6.5 twin screw supercharger and it's a 485 horse kit, so it's making a little bit of extra boost and it has larger fuel injectors. So these changes of both the new intake manifold and supercharger and fuel injectors will require some calibration changes to the ECU to make this thing run properly. Our goal is to make this car run just as good as a normal factory Mustang GT so that the casual user could hop into the car and have a reasonable expectation this car will drive and behave as normal. I want my mom to be able to drive this car to and from the grocery store or parallel park it on a busy city street without having to worry about throttle control issues. Speaking of throttle control, since we're going to have a really good handle on our airflow numbers, we're going to take that airflow number that we know to be correct and we're going to work backwards and solve for the electronic throttle control tables. Now, the modern cars all have electronic throttle control, which means that the driver's foot position merely indicates a request. We need to process that request effectively and give the driver exactly as much power as he's asking for. Not too much, not too little. If we give him too much power and the power delivered is greater than what he's demanding with his right foot, we can end up in a runaway condition. Now we've all seen on the news how that can make national headlines. None of us tuning cars in the aftermarket want to make national headlines for cars that are running away. So in order to avoid that, we're going to take a look at a method that gives us the same kind of results as the factory. We're going to make sure that the airflow delivered by our system exactly matches the kind of power the driver is asking for and we'll tune the electronic throttle control so that that nasty wrench light on the dash only comes on if there is a legitimate failure. We're going to make sure on the other side of that that it will come on if there's a legitimate failure. I know a lot of tuners out there just flat out turn off these safety checks because it's an inconvenience to have the customer stranded on the side of the road with the wrench light on but we know that that's there for their own safety. And so we are not going to turn off a safety check. We'll calibrate it properly. And when we do that, we'll find that the car becomes very drivable. That's really our drivability tuning on most of these cars. And so that will give us a car that is very pleasant for anyone to hop behind the wheel of. In addition to electronic throttle control, we'll also talk about returnless fuel systems. These cars are equipped with an electronic returnless fuel system, and it's a variable speed pump. So it's not just an on-off switch, it actually gets a pulse with modulation to the pump. And so any change to the fuel system, whether it be the pump, a second pump, or sometimes even a third pump added in, new fuel lines, a new fuel rail, or new fuel injectors can require a different tuning to that system. 
Well, fortunately, we have the ability to tune that whole system. We can control what kind of voltage goes to that pump and therefore control the pump speed and pressure and fuel flow delivered to the engine so that the pump exactly matches the airflow what the driver is requesting at the engine. That way we have solid control of both the rail pressure and the air fuel ratio under any conditions. So get your laptops ready. Let's take a closer look at this vehicle and follow along as we go from start to finish in making this car drive just like it did as it came off the factory assembly line. Before we get started on any major tuning project, I would like to know what I'm up against. So I take a quick inventory of what's done to the car. This usually means that I sit down with the customer or the owner of the car and go over a checklist and say, what did you do to this car? Tell me everything that's done to this car because nothing is unimportant. Sometimes customers go, well, uh, yeah, well, all I did was add an exhaust. Well, what about the throttle body? Oh yeah, well, I changed that too. Now in this case, it's pretty simple because it's just the Celine kit on top of a mostly stock Mustang GT. It's got a different axle back system. It's got a set of Borla mufflers on it, but they didn't change the factory exhaust manifolds or catalysts. So all of that on the front end of the exhaust is still stock. Our biggest change is right here on the supercharger, but luckily they've kept the factory twin throttle bodies. Now, if they change throttle bodies, we can get into a lot of trouble unless we know the data on these throttle bodies. Now, if they change to a Shelby throttle body, it's not so bad because we can always pull up a Shelby file and copy and paste the values. But in this case, it's a stock throttle body on a stock 463 valve engine. So we're in pretty good shape here. Another thing that they didn't change on this kit is the air box. This is still the factory Ford air box. And here's the mass airflow sensor in the factory tube. So we're reasonably certain that the mass airflow sensor's transfer function is gonna be the same as stock in this vehicle. Before we start running our car on the dyno, let's make sure that we have enough safety equipment in place and a good safety plan should the worst happen. Now, obviously we're gonna make sure we have some sort of fire suppression system on hand, whether they're regular fire extinguishers or an overhead system. We wanna be able to respond if an emergency happens. But even if we're prepared for an emergency, better than that is let's make sure that we prevent an emergency in the first place. So step one to preventing that is make sure that our car on the dyno is not going anywhere. So we've got straps attached to all the corners and these straps are pretty rigidly attached so that car is not going anywhere as we start applying horsepower to the rolls. Now we're gonna be running the car inside of a room. Well, we're burning gasoline and making CO and CO2. We don't wanna be breathing that. Carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide can poison you and kill you but even if they don't kill you, they can just leave you feeling miserable at the end of the day of tuning if you don't have adequate ventilation. Now, this shop has a really good approach to it. We have both these vertical columns here, which are attached to an 8,000 CFM fan, which we're trying to draw right off the tailpipes here and get most of the exhaust gases right out of the building. But in addition to that, we've also got about 30,000 CFM worth of fan over here. We'll begin by opening the SCT Advantage software, and in the software, it's gonna ask us to enter a processor code or a strategy. In this case, we're just gonna enter the processor code because we're gonna treat the Celine as if it's a regular Mustang GT that just happens to have the supercharger on it. We're not gonna piggyback on the Celine calibration because I wanna show you the process necessary to get everything else in line as well. So we'll start by just typing in that box code from that factory processor. So in this case, it was a JVE3. So we'll just type that in here and tell it to find it. And give it a second and it'll bring it up. Okay, not a surprise, we reflashed the car with a new calibration that tells it that we have the larger 39 pound per hour fuel injectors, but still a stock mass airflow sensor. And our modified value file for supercharging. And the car fires right up and runs. Now it may not run ideal. The startup had a little bit of more overrun than we might like but we'll still smooth that out with some of our future electronic throttle control changes. What we're really looking for now is a good open loop fuel calibration validation in this case. Now, if the MAF sensor was different from stock, we'd expect it would need some massaging, but right now we see we're pretty close to stoichiometry here. We're within about 5% here, and my live link shows the same thing. So the whole trick to making open loop fueling corrections is to take a couple key pieces of recorded information. In our case, one of the things we're really looking for is the MAF A to D counts. So you see in this particular recording, we recorded them in the purple line here, and you can see the stair step because that's me as the driver holding it steady state at each one of these points on the MAF curve under load. 
Remember, we weren't just freewheeling the engine, we were working against a road load for the car. So there is a little bit of resistance and it's realistic to how this engine is gonna be operating in the real world. So we get a nice stable reading here and we're holding it as steady airflow, which means we have a steady MAF A to D counts. Now, one of the cool things about the Ford system is the short-term fuel trim. Our next calibration task, now that we know the MAF transfer function is right most of the way up, is to fix the load with failed MAF table. Now we know this car has a supercharger attached to it, and so we know that different throttle position openings can give us very different airflow rates than what a stock car had. Okay, now that we have a really good idea of what our mass airflow sensor is doing, and we also have a really good idea of what our instantaneous load would be based on the load with failed MAF table, we have a pretty good idea of what the airflow measurement is at any given time. Well, now that we have a drive-by wire system, we need to find out how we turn a driver's request into some sort of actual airflow target. And then after we know the airflow target, we can evaluate how we want to get there. The first step in this process is to interpret what the driver is requesting. That comes from the driver demand engine table here. So the driver demand engine table has pedal position on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis has engine RPM. Now you see the red lines up here are the changes as a result of our SCT value file, but all the As we said in the introduction, these cars include an electronic returnless fuel system. So there's this returnless fuel pump section in the software down here. And really the main table that we're going to adjust here is this one right here called fuel pump voltage table. If we open it up, we see that there are two axes to it. One is target RAP, and that's rail absolute pressure. And the other one is fuel flow. And this is basically volumetric flow rate of the pump. So we see that if we're trying to target higher pressure and higher flow, we have a bigger number in the table. Well, this number in the table really represents voltage to be delivered to the pump. So these 4.6 liter three valve cars also have a variable camshaft. So we have this entire section here dedicated to variable cam, and we have a couple tables that really matter here. There's a variable cam angle load and a variable cam angle torque, and both of those have both an IMRC open and closed tab. Now, since this supercharger is set up so that it has no IMRCs, it should only be working off of the open tab, but it's nice to make sure that both tables are the same anyway. So in this video, we did a lot of tuning on a single car, but we learned lessons that can be applied to just about any late model Ford. Remember, even if you're working on an old Fox Mustang, the procedure for tuning the mass airflow sensor is basically the same. Even if we have a 96 GT, hey, they've still got that load with failed math table. So all those lessons we learned today on this more complex car can be applied to some of those older cars and even up into the newer cars. So let's keep in mind that the key to the process here was always following the procedure and making sure that we have one piece of the puzzle in place before we move on to the next. In this case, the real cornerstone to everything was good fuel injector data and good mass airflow sensor calibration. If we screw either of those up, we start carrying a lot of errors over into things like that low with failed math table, or in this case, the electronic throttle control tables. We know that we only change the things that we really had to. Remember, some of those value file changes are not necessarily your friend. So always go back through your software and double check and make sure you understand what changes you're making. And more importantly, make sure you understand what those changes are doing to the ECU. If you're not sure, probably time to give those guys at SCT a ring and ask them specifically why they're doing this. You may or may not agree with it, but remember, it's up to you. As long as we do everything properly here, we saw that we can make a lot of horsepower with a car and still retain a lot of drivability, especially with electronic throttle control. In my opinion, it's actually easier to make an electronic throttle control car more behavable in traffic than it is a cable throttle car because we can have very tight control over those small blade angles. And even if we have a 700 horsepower car or even just a 500 horsepower car like this one, it's a lot easier to control it in traffic and in and out of those parking spaces when we have a nice subtle rate of change down low, but a very aggressive rate of change up top so it responds to the driver. Now we also learned that the electronic fuel pump is not necessarily our enemy. We see a lot of people taking them off and just going to a straight up return fuel system and we realize that tuning them is really not all that hard. In fact, the ECU almost does it for you 
all we have to do is take what it's learned before and apply it to our base tables. If those base tables are right the first time around, there's not a whole lot left over for corrections. I hope you learned a lot of this video and stay tuned for some more training from Calibrating Success in the future. In addition to our training DVDs like the one you just watched and our essay design series of engine management books, we also offer in-depth, hands-on seminars calibrated to take you to the next level. We go on the road with an EFI calibration seminar as well as advanced GM and Ford courses featuring small class sizes with hands-on solutions to tough tuning issues. For details, check us out at calibratedsuccess.com.